Welcome to another Gear Gadget. If you're unfamiliar with this content, it's something new that we've been doing on our channel, and basically they are hybrid product reviews, and it's not the same old stale, read a spec sheet off someone's product listing on a website. That's not what this is. This is personal user experience, what our thoughts are on the product, whether we'd buy it again, whether we think it's a piece of trash. Before we get into the specific products for this episode, gotta lay some ground rules down. Number one, we're not here to bash any brands. So that even though we're gonna be talking about products, we typically do not mention specific brands just out of being professional. Number two, there is no use of the words game changer. Does not happen. If that term is used in this show, you're, you're kicked out. You're out of here. Never coming back. Never coming back. And what's the third rule? Is there a third rule? Like and subscribe. That's it. Three rules. Pretty damn easy. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Jake, you starting? Yeah. So um, I have a very interesting product here. Um, you know, bought this call two years ago, and I'm not going to say the, the bad word here that we said we couldn't say, but <laughs> it has changed. Um, it has changed some things in late October, November for sure. And typically in the past, I hadn't had really any luck with any vocalizations in the woods. Now that might have been parcel dependent, pressure dependent, but the last two years I've had this, it's killed a 10 and a half year old buck. And it gave me an opportunity on another really good buck last year, solely. Not like, you know, brought them in. <laughs> and so it is the Extinguisher by Illusion Game Systems. And what's interesting about their whole product line, and I think it kind of fits what we do here at Exodus, it's about educating the consumers. So they have a long tutorial list on how to vocalize in different scenarios for different events. And that's pretty, I mean, that's, I think, probably why they've found a lot of success over the years. So that's my first and favorite thing about that because I haven't used a lot of vocalizations in the past. And there's so much, you talk to some people like, oh, I would never do it. And then some people are like, you know, that's all I do. And then <laughs> I'd say I'd mix somewhere in between the two. But two quick case studies, the first one being uh, in 20, 2019, I killed a 10 and a half year old deer. Um, it was a scenario where this deer I had on camera earlier, beat up, ragged, definitely don't want to, you know, grunt on him very loud or like a challenging grunt. And this little slider here <laughs> has buck, doe, and fawn. So what I did is this deer was hung up in the brush um, and my scent was kind of shooting over to a cliff and he was all the way over on the edge, like he could not get any further to, to win me. And if he wanted to check out what this was, he'd have to walk out and I'd have a shot opportunity. So I literally just, Fawn bleated the other direction as quiet as I could, and then I was still able to kind of like see that he reacted. He went away, and then I went it down a little bit louder, <laughs> did it again, he kept circling back, ended up putting an arrow through that deer. This past year, <laughs> deer was work, came in, worked about 60 yards out of range, and was walking away, definitely looking for a doe. It was November 6th, and I put this sucker down to doe, <laughs> and it did, couldn't hear me, couldn't hear me, and then I just grounded as loud as I could. Ears perked out, turned around, beeline right to me 30 yards. I biffed the shot, but it gave me an opportunity there that I don't think would have happened there that morning. So pretty awesome, pretty awesome product. Two questions. Sure. Those types of scenarios, like obviously you have visual on the animal, right? You have a visual on the deer, you know where he is. Pretty good setups to use some type of vocalization where they can't get downwind and scent check what's making that noise. So like that's, and like in those scenarios, like to me, that's the most important thing, right? Like you're set up perfect. So in any other scenario are you blind calling no no i i typically don't and even um this past year i lost this it was another pack and i was scrounging through my vehicles and like looking for another call i found another one and i just, <laughs> I just stayed in my pack and i was not another extinguisher it was just like an old wood one. Oh, okay okay and i was just like i'm not even gonna do it <laughs> i just don't have confidence in it right uh but yeah i mean that's the biggest thing and even the one i the deer i called him 30 yards last year it was my wind was shooting uh, out in an open area and that's exactly where he went, and I had an opportunity to shoot right. before I was going to get winded any second. Right. Um, right. So that was the scenario there. Yeah, that's super important. And I think being able to see what they do uh, and how they react as well is very important. Right. So, yeah, right. I wouldn't blind call, but um, – and even with the 
the deer I shot two years ago, like I knew that deer did not, he was not looking for a fight. He was simply looking for does, opened up a scrape earlier that morning uh, that I saw. So it's like, he's looking for a doe, let him know that there's one over here and it works. Right. Well, that's the nice thing about that call is the adjustability. So like, you don't have to have a bleak can, you don't have to have a grunt call. If you're watching that deer's body language and you're like, okay, he's either timid, I don't want to do some mature buck grunt at him, mm -hmm. or you're, he's like ripping a scrape up and you're like, that's a dominant buck, I'm going to grunt at him. Yeah. You, could, you have the ability to just, with a dial, just change that so you don't have to carry a bunch of stuff with you. Um, I'm a proponent for vo deer vocalizations in the woods. I know one of the first hunts we had together, we had a, um, a buck come under us we couldn't see. Uh, we knew he's working a scrape, and I was like, Chad, you have a grunt call. And you have, like, a story about why you never use a grunt call anymore. And I was like, well, we need to make some type of noise that, will get that deer over to us that otherwise wouldn't come check us out because he's on a route that um, just isn't leading him to us. So what do you have to lose? You might as well make some noise. He's either going to come or he's going to go away, which he was doing anyway. Mm -hmm. So I just shook that branch, and that deer came in, like, instantly. Like, on, a, on a rope. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that, I think if it would have been a grunt call or whatever, like, whatever that noise was challenging that deer, I think it would have been the same. You would have had the same reaction. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. So I'm, I'm a proponent for – the uh, deer vocalizations, and I'm a proponent for that call. I have had success with this too. Yeah, I actually have not killed a buck that I did not <laughs> use. I've, That's an endorsement. <laughs> honestly, I, yeah. I've killed four bucks with a bow, and every one of them I have either bleated or grunted with that call. And I've mixed in some, like, paw on the ground and scraping in leaves and shaking trees, but that was the call that I had on me. And, yeah, it's been it's been successful. This year, actually... It was a scenario where I, you have those scenarios where like you wouldn't kill the deer if it wasn't for something. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this year I would not have killed the buck that I did if I wasn't in a saddle and I didn't have that call. And it kind of went hand in hand because I, I put myself in a position where the tree was between me and the deer. And I had, um, there was like some oaks, red oaks dropping uh, late in November that I noticed the, a bunch of does were hanging out in this area. So I put myself on the backside of the tree from that oak flat and this, a fawn came in and she was eating like 20 yards below me. Mm -hmm. And there was this buck chasing like four or five does throughout the oak flat, like out way out of range. So I turned around because the, the deer couldn't see me and I have that fawn and I bleated away. And that buck like looked over, saw that that doe was eating in front of me and came right into her and I shot him. So... That was just one of those scenarios where I think I even could have grunted, but he might not have seen another buck and he would have had a different reaction. So I just slid it down to doe, bleated, and he came and checked her out and I shot him. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm I'm all in on the extinguisher game call. I think it's a, a piece of gear. I think a grunt call or some type of deer vocalization um, is beneficial to deer hunters and I will continue to use it. Well, Cameron mentioned like why that specific call, why you like that specific call. Is there a, a an, another reason, or maybe it's the same reason, Jake? That, that like the extinguisher is your call, the call that you always use. Is there a reason like that's better than anything else? That's you know, I'm like the the study where the dog gets the treat when the bells run. <laughs> it worked, <laughs> so I'm gonna use. Yep. Got so it. that's really what it boils down to. It's Got just it. uh, past success. Got it. Um, until someone comes out with something better and has the same. Uh, information to provide to why it's better and like the tutorials but we'll probably use this grunt call for that it. is one thing cool about them like they are pumping out information along a lot along the same lines we are like they're pumping out educational content about different scenarios different calls yeah. different reactions different vocalizations different visual visualizations to help people have a better experience with the product and there's not a lot of people that do that in mm -hmm. our industry most people are using gimmicks they're not they're doing it the right way so Pretty, pretty damn cool. Yeah, because yeah, I think that's a tool that could be misused. 100%. Like, I still think it is. Either. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right. So them providing the knowledge and how to. and um, I don't know. If you've watched some of these episodes, too, you'll kind of pick up on our different styles. And um, I'm a minimalist. So having one call is all I need to take. That's, like, my reason for that. Jake's like, no muss, no fuss. Like, it works. I'm going to use it. And then chad doesn't use any of it because <laughs> that's chad's style so he's a i'm just he, a little bit of a skeptic he's a skeptic I guess. Yeah, yeah so and you have a reason for why you don't carry a grunt tube 
because of that deer that you shot the grunt yeah i'll tell it yeah i'll I'll tell that story real quick um not one of these deer one of the deer out in the uh, main part of the office this was uh, i don't know 20 i'm trying to think what year that was 2013 something i don't know i can't remember um had a grunt tube hanging around my neck hunting out of a climber had an encounter with this same deer the day before chasing a doe could not get him to stop and i mean i'm grunting at him whistling at him yelling at him and they're just you know i think we've all probably had an experience like that you're just so frustrating the deer's there you just cannot get him to stop and this goes on for minutes anyways go back in that same area the following day i'm in the stand for maybe 20 minutes and this is like a midday walk-in because i had to walk through open ag fields to get into this little pinch mm-hmm. didn't want to go in in the morning because i know the, where the deer were going to be didn't want to bump them out so i went in well after daylight slept in you know mid-morning hunt and i remember sitting in the stand actually i'm using a climber summit viper you know has the big the, yep. the, the chair rail or the bar safety bar there I remember sitting in the climber and the one cornfield had just been picked blackbirds everywhere just you've probably seen that like mm-hmm. thousands of them just chirping can't hear anything you know it's kind of frustrated sitting there a couple minutes go by boom catch movement out of the corner of my eye here he comes he's quartering to me hard he gets it within i don't know it was a close shot he was under under 25 yards so as he was moving forward, I was going to take the quarter and two shot. I felt pretty comfortable as he started to, to turn a little bit. So as I draw my bow, I lean over that safety rail. Like that's, you know, anybody that shoots bows out of tree stands, like the proper form is to bend at the waist, mm-hmm. keep your anchor points good, and make the shot. So that's playing through my head. I do all of that, not being conscious of where that grunt tube is. It's on a lanyard around my neck. As I lean forward, set on my pin, make the shot, boom, something slaps me in the face. Deer runs off, I don't see the arrow, my lips are bleeding. I'm like, what in the hell just happened? I hear something hit the ground, deer runs off, he stops like 50 yards away from me. I go to grunt at him just to, I mean, I had no idea what was going on. That's the first thing that ran in my mind. I'm like, okay, grunt, maybe he'll come back. Maybe he thinks that, you know, he got blindsided by another deer. I go to blow my grunt tube and it sounds like a freaking duck call. I'm like, what in the hell? Look at the grunt call, the tube's gone. So long story short, as I bent at the waist to make that shot, the lanyard swung away from my body Mm -hmm. and my bowstring basically cut that call in half. Came up, smacked me in my face, killed the deer. It was a liver shot. I got extremely lucky, like my arrow just Just wasn't totally errant. Um, But because of that, I do still carry a grunt call. I just am hesitant to use it like on public ground because I think that so many people overdo it or blind call that a lot of deer have negative connotations to yeah. to that now if i see a deer it's a kind of a different different story and i think cameron's probably the one that opened my eyes to being more aggressive with vocalizations but maybe not always coming from some type of call yeah yeah, yeah. if you can use something else like shaking a tree or um i, I watched i think it was aaron Warbritton was like right outside of a bedding area in iowa and he just went and started going nuts, man. He stood up, was grunting, shaking trees, rolling on the ground, kicking and making a bunch of stuff. And this giant buck gets out of his bed and comes and checks him out. Yeah. So I think if you can mix it up and make it sound more realistic Paint than just... Paint picture. Yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in gear. Yeah, gear all day. Gear. Um, what I brought today was something that if you would have asked me last year, I probably would have said it was a gadget. And this year I'm going to present it as gear so again keep in mind my minimalist style i don't want to take extra stuff in the woods chad and i would talk about this all the time but this here is the mission platform from trophy line and it is a saddle platform and the previous year i just ran a um, set of sticks with a platform on top it was the one from uh artisan artisan fabrication Hunt Fish Fab. Yeah. 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 Um, Zach Snyder, I think is his name. Yeah. It's a nice platform. Uh, it just sits on top of your sticks, and I'm thinking, okay, if I'm going to hunt out of a saddle, the reason I want to hunt out of a saddle is to be light and mobile. If I'm going to use a platform, why don't I just take a tree stand? It's the same thing. I still have to hang it. And I hunted off of that uh, stick platform for the whole year, and it was nice, but I would just find myself in scenarios where, one, I couldn't sit, and sit very long, and two, uh, side pressure, it just wouldn't take side pressure very well. So if you get in a position where you need to kick off the side, the bottom of that stick just wants to kick out because it, a stick's just not made to be to have that side pressure. 
So last year I did a bunch of research and I was like, okay, I'm going to get a saddle platform. And it has made saddle hunting a lot more comfortable and a lot more effective. And I think the moment that I knew I needed to switch was when we met with John Eberhart. Mm -hmm. And he was telling us about how most people that hunt out of a saddle are hunting out of a saddle wrong. And they're just all these giant platforms. You don't need them because you don't want to be, you don't want to be hanging off the tree. You want to be right behind the tree. You want to be close. You don't want to be some branch hanging off. So I knew I needed to change something because the only way to comfortably stand on that stick was to like lean back and it pushed me further away from the tree. I like to keep a short bridge and my tether close and I like to be close to the tree. This platform actually is a little bit too big. I'm going to downsize this year. I'm probably going to stay with trophy line and do the, the EDP. But if you're saddle hunting and you're thinking like I did, like, oh, just need to take a tree. Like, why would I take a saddle if I could just hunt out of a tree stand? The platform makes it so much more comfortable. And you can definitely shoot 360 degrees around the tree from just this. You don't need a ring of steps. You can put yourself in a position to push off the sides and make the shot that you need by having a platform that you would not have the opportunity to do with just the stick platform. I think that is the the biggest difference because I was in the same – I mean, I was trying to talk you out of buying. I'm like, there's no point. Like, just, you just run what we have. The sticks are modded. You can do everything you need to do. And after you bought this, like, you were, you know, talking about it, you know, we messed around with it at the office out back. And I was like, oh my gosh, like Cameron's freaking right. Like me being skeptic, trying to talk you out of it. And here I am like this year, like I'm moving towards this. Um, and I think there, there's two big, you mentioned both of them, but the two biggest reasons for it are one, being able to shoot around the tree without having a ring of steps. You can make any, like any, any shot that you can run through your brain, you can make with that. Absolutely. Weak side, turning around, like, I don't recommend that. Like, you know, after, like you said, after talking to John, like there's a specific way that you should always be shooting strong side. Yeah. And if and if you're not, then you need to at least take it into consideration of how John's teaching people how to use saddles because the dude's been doing it for 40 years. There's he no has it. There's no one better, period. Like, yeah. it, doesn't, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. He's yeah. the best. So being able to do that, walk around a tree with that, not necessarily walking around a tree, but using your position of your feet to get around – you're always shooting strong side. And then two is the comfort. Like yeah. you don't realize how much you're kind of squirming and like moving, standing up, sitting down to take pressure off your knees when you're using a smaller platform being pitched away from the tree. Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I don't know which platform I'm going to get. I probably agree with you. This is a little too big, even though I have giant feet, size 13 feet. It's still probably a little bit too big. Yeah. Um, you can get away with a little bit less, but made in the USA, yeah. awesome freaking product. Uh, definitely something that I'm adding into probably the only thing that I'm adding to my arsenal this year is a saddle platform. Yeah, that's interesting. I bought a smaller platform on a whim because I waited till October, November, everything was out of stock. Yeah. So I had one that I could literally fit in my pocket. I hunted out of it like two or three times. Like I'm moving around way too much. I'm uncomfortable. Um, and so I actually scooped one of these up when they came back in stock. I haven't used it yet. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to using something like this based on your guys' uh, feedback. So, Oh, this thing is rock solid on the tree, too. Like, you can jump on the sides. You can do whatever you want, and it's not going to budge. But just kind of to um, show what Chad was talking about. So if you're standing on this platform here, and we can even put this out on the tree and kind of give a demonstration to um, illustrate this better. But if you have this strapped to the tree and... You have a deer that's coming in on this side. The thing that most saddle hunters are doing are turning their body, and they're trying to make a, a shot like this, and it's just so uncomfortable. You go up and over. If you're shooting left yeah, hand, so you're you going up bridge. and over your bridge. Yeah. So you twist to, in your body, twist in your hips. Like yeah, it's no, awkward. It's awkward, and one, it's just so much movement. If that deer is coming over here, and this is your tree, you have your tree here, you put your feet this way, that deer can't see you move. You have the tree in between you and you work yourself to a position, you can stand on this part of this platform because it's it has that surface. You stand on this part of the platform, it's not gonna budge and you execute your shot. And you're close to the tree, you're tight to the tree, you're using the tree for a blocker, and it's still a strong side shot at like two o'clock. Yep, it's, yeah. I 
again, I probably wouldn't have killed the deer that I killed this year if it wasn't for, if I was on a stick platform, I wouldn't have made the shot. With all things considered, your uh, modified step last year in comparison to this, like if you had to put a number one to 10 on, like effectiveness, comfortable, you know, com how comfortable it is, everything, the modified stick versus this, where do they rank on a scale one to 10? Okay, um, I'm gonna put the, the modified stick at like a, a six or a seven because it gets people into sa I think that like people's first initial thoughts are like, okay, I'm gonna, same thing we thought, like, okay, if I'm gonna run a saddle, I could just put my sticks up and hunt. Mm -hmm. And it's nice, it's mobile. If you have like a two hour sit or a last hour sit, I still might use that so you don't have to hang this. Mm -hmm. um, and the accessibility is nice. The cost is cheaper. So yeah, I'll give it like a six, six and a half. And um, this is like a, this platform itself, I'm gonna, I would give it like an eight, but having a saddle platform to hunt out of with a saddle, I'm gonna say it's like a nine, man. Like. You just, you, you, that's the way it's, should be done. I've never used a ring of steps, but I can't imagine them being comfortable. And that's part of the, like, no. if you can sit there longer and be out in the woods longer, and this is going to help you do it, yeah. your chances of being successful are greater. I so. think just being able to sit still longer well, that's, is the biggest thing of that well, too. My mentality around it, and we, you know, Matt and I bought saddles back in 2015. We were running the old, trophy line, um, like the neoprene, big, mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of the model, just sold that after we got tethered, tethered saddles, and then we ended up with um, uh, cruiser. cruiser saddles. But anyways, I have used screw in steps and tried to walk them around the tree. And my, my, my mind set around that is, okay, it's gonna be uncomfortable, I'll just suffer. Like that's, you know, that's the, like, <laughs> not, to, about right. not to be a hard O, like, <laughs> yeah. but that's, you know, that's the way I am. Yeah. Like I'm stubborn about stuff like that. And the problem is, yeah, you can suffer through it, but you end up fidgeting and moving yeah. and like, it's just not worth being hard headed to get picked off by deer for, for just being stubborn. It's, yeah, it's just not worth it. Yeah. You went through all that suffering and then ruined your shot and it's like, okay, now what do I, yeah, <laughs> yeah I might as well it's just had a platform. It's just not worth it. Yeah. And that's where it went with me. It was like, okay, with the stick platform, what I was doing and I was like, I, I should have just had a platform. Mm -hmm. So I bought one. And I mean, if you're in the market for a saddle platform, 2021 is your year. <laughs> Plenty of options. Oh my God, it blew up. So yeah, I'm going to be changing. I'm, I'm going to keep this just because there's no really, there's no reason to get rid of it. But I think I'm going to, I'm definitely going to go to a lower profile one, maybe the XOP edge or the, uh, E trophy EDP. line EDP. I thought about running the Cruiser Seeker, but the more I think about it and the uh, the more I think of John, what John Eberhart would tell me, like, so just for example, that Cruiser platform, it gave everyone what they've everyone's been asking for. So if you run a saddle platform, the most way, the biggest way to make it comfortable is this is the way it's level on the tree. So this is this is how the um, bracket will be on the tree. Your platform is angled. That that's how you'll make it the most comfortable. The cruiser has this is flat, and then the edge of it has like a a pitch to it. And what that forces you to do is stand on this pitch, and now you're hanging away from the tree. Now you're you're way out here away from the tree. The comfortability from it is gonna you're gonna be so comfortable standing on that thing. But the chances of getting picked off and using the saddle correctly, I think it just it, it's going to make it um, it's going to give someone like the idea that they're going to be stealthy and comfortable. But one of the things you know that I've learned is when you're pitched away and you have all your weight on your t on your tether, so you have your bridge coming up, you have your tether, and you're standing away from the tree, like you're leaning away from the tree. And I do this, I still do this sometimes. But when you're in that position and you need to move. It's a hell of a lot harder to do that because all the weight is buried on your bridge around your hips and you're pushed back, you know, pushed back with your feet. It's, it's comfortable for an extended period of time just to, you're just hanging out. But when you have to move, like you have to gather yourself up, tighten your core, get your legs underneath of you, and then you're messing with your tether. Like it's just, it's, it's not freaking worth it. Like listen to John Eberhardt and do it his way. Yep. So run a saddle platform and 
just to piggyback off like using saddles the most efficient way, get a uh, rope man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So another can of can of worms. Yeah, so that's it from that saddle platform is my gear. It's a piece of gear. It's not a gimmick. It's not a gadget. It's not something to get you to buy something else to run with your saddle. And don't think of it as like if I'm gonna be using a saddle platform, I should just be using a tree stand because it's not the same. Agreed. Interested. Agreed. Yeah. Cool. Gear all day. So I guess that leaves me, right? Yep. Um. This is going to come as a shocker for a lot of people. Oh what I'm what I'm about to talk about. I brought in lighted Knox. And I am going to make an argument why you do not need to shoot lighted Knox. Okay. Now there's a obviously the, over the last 10 years giant argument why you should why you should shoot lighted Knox. You can see your shot if you're filming, you have a better idea where that buck is hit. There's a better increased or increased chances to recover your arrow after the shot mm -hmm. to, I mean, help increase the odds of a better track job. Yep. Like, there's a lot of reasons you should shoot light and Knox. Now I'm going to tell you why you, you shouldn't shoot them. Let's hear it. Well, number one, again, not brand bashing. Every freaking lighted knock on the market, except for Fire Knock, <laughs> yeah. except for Fire Knock, Fire Knock does it right. Uh -huh. Every other lighted knock on the market is a piece of trash. They're junk. They don't work. They break. Like, I, I went through four, three or four different brands last year, trying to figure out which ones would activate the most consistent, which ones were the easiest to turn off, which ones did better when it got cold because the tolerances on on them are just bogus like in my mind i'm thinking i'm gonna have an arrow knocked i'm gonna let one fly and the knocks the knocks gonna be cracked because the tolerances are so bad yeah like absolutely despise them but i felt forced to use them because of the flip side about? what like what are your other options okay don't shoot lighted knocks when well, now you're gonna have a harder time finding arrows mm -hmm. you're not gonna know where you hit the deer it doesn't look as cool on film right like all those reasons i'm like well i'm stuck i'm just i gotta use them and then the other thought is the added weight for guys who are trying to bump up FOC, like you add just a couple grains on the back end of your arrow and you have to add like four times what you're put on the back to put on the front to equal it out. Yeah. It's like a whole can of worms. Like I was, I was pissed, I was frustrated. Until last year, I was hunting with Clint Campbell from Truth From The Stand. He doesn't shoot lighted knocks. We were in Missouri, he had a film guy, he had a videographer there filming a hunt. The knocks he was using come standard with day six arrows. These white, solid white plastic knocks. When we played his shot back, and this is low light. This mm -hmm. is like last light. Sun's down. Mm -hmm. So 15 minutes, you know, until it until closing time. Low light. When he shot this arrow and we played it back on film, it was a freaking white laser beam. Interesting. White laser beam. And that same trip, I let one fly, light a knock. Again, I'm not going to say the, the brand, but light a knock. Um, I think it was blue or green. I can't remember. Blue. Was it blue? It didn't look nearly as good on film as this, this white light a knock did. Now, for that reason, I'm switching to these this year. You don't have to worry about the added weight. They're lighter than this. The only downside to this is if your arrow gets buried under leaves, it's yeah. going to be harder to find. It's going to be Without a doubt, you're going to have to spend more effort trying to find your arrow after the shot. Which, if you don't recover it and you killed the deer, it's like. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah, if it's the shot's more. questionable. Yeah. Then, like, it's, I no, I think it is important. Like, it's, it's probably one of the most important steps in blood trailing deer is looking at your arrow and trying to identify. Right, if you don't see. And if you it. can't find it, then it, it, it can be like. Yeah. Well, it's a panic. It's almost yeah, like two years ago. I still haven't found the arrow of the deer I shot, and I've gone back like two winters, like now, mm -hmm. scouring the area. I still can't find my arrow. It has to be buried in a hill somewhere. Yeah. So, so it's. I don't think it's something to necessarily worry about. Like it's not going to change my opinion on on shooting these knocks, because I'm just, listen, like the fire knock stuff. I've shot for a couple of years. They are absolutely fantastic. They work every single time. They turn on every single time. 
They're easy to turn off. Proper tolerances. The tolerances are right. Like the design, like George does it, George does it right. The downside is, is they are freaking expensive. Like that's, that's just it. They're expensive. Um, now I do have existing arrows that have those on that I won't, I'll, I'll, I won't change. Like I have spare batteries for them and pins, all that, the PCB board that goes inside. Right. I think mean, like they're technical <laughs> install. Like it, you're not just they're plugging these things yeah. into the end of an arrow. Like I took mine to a archery shop and had them installed by one of George's certified Dealer, dealers. Yeah. Cause there's a whole process to even get certified, to get certified, yeah. to even use his components and his products. Yeah. Cause they're that, that technical. So my words of, advice if like if you've had bad experience with lighted knocks and you're tired of all these trash freaking knocks check out these white solid knocks or if you're against that and you have to shoot lighted knocks buy fire knock buy fire knocks like their hand the hands down they're the best and everyone that has ever touched them or used them will say the same thing mm -hmm. the downside is they're just expensive yeah i so i have the serious uh i think the serious apollo and they actually come standard with white knocks. And um, listening to what you were saying about Clint's and everything you're saying right now, I'm actually going to just go back to the standard white knocks, use white fletchings, and yes, um, that just makes everything much more visible. So I was like, I had a bad experience not using lighted knocks, but it was my own fault. Okay. I had, I was like trying to be cool. I was trying to get my setup, was like looking sweet, you know? I had black arrow, I had three black veins, and I had a black knock. I was <laughs> murdered out. It was blacked Look out. Cool. I Look was like, cool. ooh, that's sweet. And then I shot two deer that year. No idea where I hit them. None. I could not see the arrow. So I shot two bucks that year. Uh, the first one was actually not a great shot. I uh, recovered the arrow because it was just laying there. I ended up finding the deer, and I was like, sure as hell not where I thought I hit him like two three weeks later same thing I shoot another buck um I I just drilled this deer like perfect shot but my gut instincts like no idea I have no idea where I hit that deer and I was like I will never ever shoot an arrow without a lighted knock after that because I was like I could not see where I hit the deer mm -hmm. but I think I would I put those white knocks on when I've been practicing and I can follow it yeah. Um, not as good as a lighted knock, but I can still follow it to where like dealing with the chance of one, the knock not lighting, two, lighting in your quiver when you don't. Oh, want I it forgot to. to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez, like, oh man. You're sitting you in the woods. Turn it off. And you just got a flashlight. Dude. Stuff. Yeah, you're sitting in the woods in the um in the dark, like in the morning, and you got this light <sighs> beam behind you, like shining, like hey, there's something up here. So many times last year, I get set up, climb up my stand, or get up you know, to where my, I'm hunting out of my saddle, I knock a freaking arrow and I'm like, okay, I got my arrow knocked. That's usually the first thing I do, screw my bow hanger in, get my bow set up, light a no or no, knock an arrow. Then I'm messing with camera gear, trying to get everything situated, whatever, working through my pack. I turn around and freaking knocks lit up. Now I'm like, I don't have any fingernails and you're trying to get the little cliff. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Get the little damn thing pushed down. And it's like, oh, and I'm pulling a knife out. <laughs> Just pull it out. Stick it in my pocket and put a new one on. Like, yeah. oh, drives me nuts. Yeah, that's a that's a big downside to um, a lot of them. And, like, everything you – you have, like, a checklist when you're looking for a lighted knock. Like, you want something bright. You want something that's easy to turn on and off. And you want something that's going to light. None of them have all three other than fire knock. Like, either they're really bright, but they're a pain in the ass to turn off. Or they're really easy to turn off, but they – are like dim as hell they're not bright or like they just all of the above don't have any of them yeah. so yeah the, you and i in the office last year were like what about this one what about this one what about this one and i ended up shooting the i've actually never had a nocturnal i've been using the nocturnals i've never had one like not go off or not work but practicing with them and the they they turn on too easily like when i knock them on an arrow or in my uh, quiver they've turned on like just way too easily for me but um one thing i will say with the uh tracking so last year my buddy brandon and i were tracking one of his bucks and he hit it in a spot where the arrow was stuck in the deer 
and we're like tracking blood following blood and it's dark and we see a light in the woods and i was like we're in like a kind of a, a residential area and i was like what's that light back there is that like a reflector or is that someone's light and he's like dude that's my knock was it in the deer stuff yeah and the deer was still alive we didn't know that and we're tracking it and we look and the deer starts kicking its shoulder and that light's going like this so we stood there and waited until that light disappeared and we knew the deer was dead. Mm. If we don't, if he doesn't have a light and knock in that instance, we're tracking blood, tracking blood, tracking bump, blood. Bump, bump, and yeah, lose and him. we end up hitting it. We end up getting into the deer. And, um, in that scenario, that deer could not move. He was hit pretty in an area where he couldn't get up and he struggled. But like in an area, a scenario where like if that happens and you have your arrow stuck in them and you can see the light like that's a benefit but that's also just like a freak incident where that you aren't typically gonna have like i said happen. there's definitely reasons to use lighted knocks but there's a lot of reasons not to use them too so yeah. like if if you're a guy that has to use lighted knocks and you've struggled with other products yeah. you might just you try fire knock just just bite the bullet use them yeah um they're hands down the best. I and haven't I've, used a lighted knock in three years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have not used a lighted no, knock. No, the three last years. last time I used one, it was in the morning. I shot a buck, it didn't go off, and I said, "This and I, and I, this is the only buck I shot with expandable blades too, and the blades didn't expand either. Ooh. Still, still killed the deer, double lunged them, but it was like this. Let's make it more simple. Yep. Six so, blade, no, no lighted knock. So what 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 color knocks are you shooting? Well, <laughs> I brought those into Dorge, and he says. He he gave me different uh, knocks. He said those are, he said those are cheap. He said yeah. you can buy those; they're super cheap. So he gave me different knocks. They're um, they're like neon green, and so, and I mean I, I did I haven't shot a deer on film to be able to see if it traced like that. But um, he had like he has his tray of like specific right. tolerances that are very good. That's that the guy I would nice. listen to. Yeah. So I was yeah, anything he says, well, I let take me, his gospel. Let me know what brand, or maybe they fire knock. Oh, yeah. the other they're fire knock non lighted. Correct, yeah. Okay. He just knock. has his own knocks. Yeah. So and if that's he has, what, I don't know if he has any white ones. Yeah. That's probably what I'll move to. That's what he suggested. If he has white, then that's what I'll move to. I, I mean, when I watched the, the footage of Clint, Clint's shot in Missouri, like, it's a freaking white laser beam. Like, I, That's interesting, yeah. yeah. What's his, what color were his fletchings? I'm not sure. I'm sure he had at least one white. I mean, that's pretty typical with a lot of bow hunters. Yeah. But for just to look at blood is to have white fletchings. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, last year I went like complete opposite of what I had before. Yeah. I went white wrap, all yeah. three white veins, and um, I'm gonna have a white knock. Yeah, so, do. Um, gear, gadget, lighted knocks. I mean, I don't use them, so I'd say it's it's a gadget. I, just, I don't use them. Cameron, gadget. <sighs> I'm not gonna say it's a gadget because there are, <laughs> there is a knock, a lighted knock. That is a piece of gear, and we yeah. keep saying it. We go back to fire knock. Like, that specific lighted knock is a piece of gear. They work hands down, period. All I'm saying is there's an argument that every other brand stinks. Stinks. And if you're shooting one of those other brands, either go to fire knock or look at these. Uh, so, is it, can you, sh okay, so we should look at this. I think if you kill a buck with a lighted knock, it cannot go in the Pope and Young book, too. Really? By, by I law. thought that was one of the exceptions. That, I could be Ooh, wrong. That's why I'm asking. I don't know. We just read the bylaws on this when we did that video about uh, cellular cameras. Um, I thought that was one of the exceptions. Lighted knocks. Okay. Um, well, the other side of it, too, is like you start going into some of the western states. Like It gets pretty, I don't know, um, wishy-washy on. Are there states that outlaw this? Lighted knocks, yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I, I always like. <laughs> um, I always say like if it's legal in PA, it's legal everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so um, lighted knocks are legal in Pennsylvania, so which is kind of a dumb rule. Like they shouldn't. I mean they they aid. I think that they aid in recovery of the yeah, an animal. Like yeah, they, the they should thing. be legal everywhere. Yeah. Maybe that's changed. I don't know. But I remember back in 2012, 2013, when I went to that. I think on that trip to Colorado, I'm not sure if they were legal there. I don't mm -hmm. think that they were. I don't know. What we'll to look it up? The regs we'll are different. The screen. Yeah. 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 We'll look it up. So, anyways, I think that's a wrap for, for this episode. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, yeah, until next time.